Hello, every morning. Uh, or <laughs> hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, uh, it's good to see you all. I uh, missed you last week. Last week was a holiday. Well, a Tuesday that followed a holiday, so we didn't have our weekly webinar, but here we are. It's June 6th, 2023, and uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, so today's format's going to just going to be a little bit different. I'm going to do my um, my slot updates, where we'll spend about 15 minutes going over some uh, all mailbag um, items, and then uh, we're going to talk about the markets for a little bit because our topic today is really big: uh, qualified charitable distributions. As I was preparing for this over the past couple of days, I thought to myself that I should have probably made this its own special webinar, you know, an hour long topic. But um, but we don't have that time today. We can always dig into it. And in fact, I have I had some discussions with um, Andy Ives um, when I saw him at National Harbor about um, about uh, doing a, a QCD special webinar. And it, there is a lot. Um, the uh, I've I've shared with you before that. Uh, the, you know, I was going to show you the manual that we walk away with, and you can see the size of it. So this is this is from one set of updates. Now we do this twice a year, so you can see the number of pages. You can see my flags and my notes here, but I'm going to be sharing some material directly from. So what is the manual? I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Uh, this is from the Ed Slide Elite Advisor Group. I'm fortunate enough to be part of the Master Elite Advisor Group, which means I've just been at it for a while. But, um, you know, these, this is some of the IRA updates, tax law updates. There's a lot of information in here. This series about the SECURE Act uh, and the SECURE 2.0 updates. So always great material from Ed and his group, but um, important, important stuff. So let me set that aside. Um, so a bit about a little bit of headlines and I, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jerry. Um, and I, I don't think we've had, have we had a webinar since? Yeah, sure, sure. We've talked uh, since the um, uh, since we had Ed Slot and David McKnight in town, and again, I just can't say enough great things about that. Um, we all know that there's been a deal reached now with the debt ceiling right up to the limit, which w we expect it, and which further gives us um, confidence that Congress is going to fail to act until they absolutely have to with our uh, tax increases that are needed. But let's talk about uh, the markets. I'm sorry. Let me <laughs> let me see one week off, and my rhythm is thrown a little bit. Um, uh, let's let's go through our Ed slot update. So I'm going to share my screen here. So um, yeah, I want you to read along with me because sometimes these can, these can get a little complex. And and in this um, uh, in this first mailbag, we're going to talk about inherited IRAs and simple IRAs creditor protection. You might remember that my last webinar a few weeks ago, we talked about. Um, IRA and retirement plan, creditor protection and bankruptcy protection. And there's a question in here about that. So let's dig into it. And this is from my friend, Andy. So in 2021, uh, the writer writes, my wife inherited an IRA from her sister who was four years younger. So my wife, therefore, is an eligible designated beneficiary. Uh, that's somebody who can, who has special rules uh, and allowances under the inherited IRA rules. And uh, there are only five. I keep them here on my notes so I remember uh, what they are uh, on a regular basis. This is relatively new. I think this came about under the first SECURE Act a couple of years ago. Um, but in this case, her sister, I'm right here if you're following along, uh, and if you're just listening to us on YouTube, I want to geez, and I didn't say. So if you're watching us for the first time and you're not yet subscribed, hit that like, subscribe, and notification button so that you're sure that you always receive notifications about our um, uh, about our webinars. So in this case, the sister fits the eligible designated beneficiary rule because uh, she is 66 years I'm I'm sorry. She is um, just four years younger than her sister. Uh, who passed away. So the p sister who passed away was 66 years old at the date of death. My wife has been taking RMDs based on her own age. What happens when my wife dies? Do all the following beneficiaries have 10 years to deplete the inherited IRA? Are there RMDs, required minimum distributions, that need to be taken each year for those beneficiaries? If so, is the RMD based on the factor that my wife is using or does it have to be refactored to the um, next beneficiaries. So 
wife, this person's wife inherited an, uh, an IRA. She fits the description for an eligible designated beneficiary, so she can do what's called a stretch IRA over her lifetime. The question this writer um, has is, um, what happens when she passes away? And if, if uh, the next person inherits it, how do they deal with those these complex rules um, that are more complex now and, and seem to be getting more complex every day uh, regarding required minimum distributions? Uh, so that, that person is Jeff. So the answer for Jeff is, uh, since this is, whoops, sorry about that. Okay. We'll see if we can edit that out. Since this is an inherited IRA after your wife's death, the next beneficiary will be a successor beneficiary. The rules dictate, dictate that a successor, uh, successor inherits an, uh, an account that was being stretched, um, right here, which this one is then the 10-year rule will apply to the successor. So the first person who's an eligible de designated beneficiary can, can do that old uh, plan that we had with uh, stretch IRAs. This person here um, can do that as an eligible designated beneficiary, but what about the successor beneficiary? Well, then the 10-year rule will apply to that successor. I'm right here. Regardless of who the successor is, it does not matter if the successor is a spouse or disabled or could otherwise qualify and is, as an EDB or eligible designated beneficiary, the successor gets the 10-year rule. Also, RMDs will apply in years one through nine of that 10-year period rule uh, be based on your wife's single life expectancy. So essentially, the successor will step into the shoes of your wife, continue with the exact same life expectancy factor, minus one for each year. People make that mistake all the time. Be careful when you're calculating inherited IRA RMDs. But we'll also have to deplete the account by the 10th year after the year of your wife's death. So unlike the wife in this situation, the wife can can take distributions for the remainder of her life, but um, as... Um, uh, uh, if the successor beneficiary will have to continue those or required minimum distributions based on the wife's le life expectancy and then reduced by one every year, life expectancy when she started and then reduced by um, one every year. But the difference is she, they're going to have to, the successor beneficiary is going to have to deplete that account completely by the end of the 10th year after they inherit the money. So a really great question. I don't know why this keeps popping up but we'll try to avoid it. Um, all right. So this person, Michelle writes, hello, I am hoping you can answer a question of, for a client of ours. So Michelle is either a CPA or a, a um, financial advisor. Very common that we get questions from those folks. He is potentially, uh, he is being potentially being sued. Are simple IRAs protected from creditors? Any guidance would be appreciated. Thank you, Michelle. And Ian writes, uh, Michelle, simple IRA accounts, do have some creditor uh, non-bankruptcy protection. However, the level of protection is based on state law. You might remember last week, and if you didn't watch, go back to watch creditor protection. Uh, it, I think the title of the, um, the webinar is, Is Your IRA Creditor Protected? So we list all the different states, and that material is put together by our friend Shannon Evans. So the level of protection is based on state law and will vary from state to state. Some states offer 100% creditor protection, but not all. If your client is potentially facing a lawsuit, he, uh, he or she should seek legal counsel to confirm what creditor protections are available within his or her state. Okay, we have two slot mailbags because we the, the first one was from last week. Now we have one from this, this, uh, this series, right, from Thursday, June 1st. And this is from Ian. So the first question is, if a 76-year-old is working full-time and has a simple IRA and she does not own any of the company that sponsors the simple IRA, does she still have to take a required minimum distribution from her simple IRA? So this person has is over the required minimum distribution date, right? Um, the the uh, currently 73 years old. However, um, this person's still working. So the question is, does the still working exemption to required minimum distributions apply to simple IRAs? So let's see Ian's answer. Um, 
The answer is, yeah. Well, the answer is, I guess I, I framed the question the wrong way. The question isn't, does it, does it apply? The question is, does this person have to take an RMD? So I um, answer is yes. Simple IRA owners can't use the still working exception to delay RMDs until they retire. That exception is only available to certain employees in 401ks, 403Bs, or 457B plans. Instead, simple IRA owners must start RMDs in the year that they turn 73. Okay, the next question here. Hello, my understanding is that there is now a new rule for missed year of death RMDs. Yeah, this is a new rule uh, for sure, and we've got to pay attention to it. But it's it's a good rule. Um, I believe that there is now an automatic waiver of the penalty if the year of death RMD is taken by the beneficiary's tax filing deadline, including extensions. All true. If the beneficiary waits until the year after the year of death to take the decedent's deceased uh, RMD, which tax year does the distribution fall into? I have inherited the IRA of my late aunt who never took a, her 2022 RMD. If I waited until 2023 to take the RMD, do I report it on my 2022 taxes or my 2023 taxes? Is the bank going to issue me a 1099R? And if so, which year will it be for? All good questions, David. So let's get David's answer. Uh, hi, David. Your understanding of the new year of death RMD rules is correct. If the year of death RMD is missed, the beneficiary does not have until um, excuse me. The beneficiary does have until his tax filing deadline with extensions to take the missed RMD. Additionally, the RMD is always taxed in the year that is actually distributed, 2023 in your example. The custodian will issue a 1099-R for that year. Okay, another good, uh, another good series of questions. Okay, I'm just checking in with the questions here. Uh, hello, everybody who said good morning. Uh, Jerry writes, be required if date of death was before the SECURE Act in 2020 for an inherited non-beneficiary uh, beneficiary designation account. Uh, so he writes BDA. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the comments or not. I'm not sure what you're asking, Jerry. Um, I would assume that anyone who passed before 2020, um, hopefully things would be resolved uh, before then, but yeah, it would, it would uh, you know, before now, but it would, um, it would carry the rules, the previous rules uh, of the, before the secure act. Good questions. Well, I prematurely put my tablet down. So let's, uh, let's go into the markets. So pretty uh, light week. Uh, there is a jobless claims to come out on Thursday, um, but uh, that's really it as far as uh, anything substantial. Um and uh, but but that'll that'll give some indication if uh, if the Fed is going to continue and to raise rates, what we call tightening or um, or take a break this this month. Many, many people believe that the, the Fed is going to take a break uh, this month and kind of reevaluate things next month. All right. So let's look at um, the markets. I got to put my glasses on for this. So uh, in, in the last week, so this is ends uh, June 2nd, right? So the week ended June 2nd, that was Friday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 2.17% for a year-to-date gain of 2.89. The S&P 500 was up 1.88% for a year-to-date gain of 12.35. Let me say that again, year-to-date 12.35. Does it feel to you like the S&P 500, our domestic markets broadly based, are up 12.35%. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your feedback. Uh, but there are the numbers. That's where we are. The NASDAQ was up another 2.07% last week for a year-to-date number of 27.01%. Uh, across the globe, um, we were up 9 point, or excuse me, 1%, 9.71% for the year, 1.26 or 3.90% for emerging markets. Um, so the larger markets were up 1% and they're up 9.71%. The emerging markets, so they're smaller economies, um, was, were up 1.26% and at 3.9% for the year. Uh, Europe, A Asia, and the Far East was up uh, almost 1%, 0.90, uh, but over 10% for the year. 
Um, and other areas still 10.8. Um, bonds are up slightly, uh, about 2.17% for the longer term bonds and 1.42% for short term bonds. And the 90 day treasury, I looked at it, I was talking to a potential client yesterday and I gave him, uh, we were talking about some um, short term investments and um, the, the three month treasury is at, I think, 5.24. So what does that mean? That you can buy a U.S. government bond with an annual yield of 5.24. You buy them, you know, they mature in 90 days. But my goodness, that's a, uh, that's a very good yield for a short commitment. And what uh, the situation we're still in is that if you committed your money for 10 years and bought the same U.S. Treasury issued bonds, but now with a 10-year maturity, maturity, you're only getting 3.69%. Compared to six months or three months at 5.24%. So um, many people feel that it doesn't make sense to buy those longer um, term yields. Um, certainly if you may need your money in the short term. Okay, so let's move along. We're going to change up and we're, we're not going to go over those analyst reports. And we're going to look right to um, the topic of the day, the financial 15 topic of the day. And that is going to be... Um, Important QCD details you should know. So this is that that typically the last 15 minutes or so of the uh, broadcast of the weekly webinar, but I'm expanding it a bit today because it's a big topic and I don't want to, I can't be here um, past 11. So um, uh, I, I don't think it'll take that long, but I want to leave plenty of time. So if you're just joining us on this portion, because we do segment them out, we have the Tuesday weekly webinar, which is the entire um, uh, length and details of the webinar, including the slot reports, including the uh, market updates and the financial 15. Um, then uh, uh, but we, we separate those out and we just have the section called the financial 15. And of course, we have the weekly webinar available for now on our YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, if you're just joining us on YouTube and you haven't already, please hit subscribe, like, and notification button so that you're sure never to miss a new webinar or Financial 15. So today is about qual qualified charitable distributions. And where does today's topic come from? Well, like most topics, it comes from a conversation someone had with me about qualified charitable distributions. And it also came from the exam that I had to take from um, the the training event, the Ed Slack training event in April, uh, where we covered QCDs quite a bit. And uh, not only I shared with you, and I'll since so if you're just joining us, uh, I'll share with you this manual again. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be part of Ed Slot's Master Lead Advisor Group, and this is an example of the manual from one training event. We have two a year and ongoing re, uh, access and resources to their great team. Uh, and every now and then, Ed even comes to town and meets with y'all. So, um, uh, oh gosh, what was my point? Oh, but we have a an exam that we have to take after this event. And there were some really good QCD or Qualified Charitable Distribution topics on that exam. So I thought I'd share them, share it with you. And, um, and I'm hearing more and more about it from clients uh, and uh, and other, you know, and prospective clients or people who just have questions. People are very interested in this QCD or qualified charitable distribution. So let's first talk about what it is. And then we're going to go over some details and little known details to the uh, QCD rules and requirements. So the QCD was really designed to, um, to handle required minimum distributions from IRAs that someone doesn't necessarily want or need during their lifetime. So um, we all know now that under the Secure 2.0 Act at age 73, the year you turn age 73, and for the first year you have, uh, you have until April 1st of the year, following the year you turn 73, to take a required minimum distribution. And the IRS tells us exactly how much that required minimum distribution is supposed to be. Uh, and there were very complex de um, requirements about where the money should come from and, and um, what needs to be distributed. But, you know, it can it can be quite a bit. Um, and many, many people say, and you have to pay tax on those distributions. So if you're, if you're fortunate enough to have a million dollars in, in your IRAs or uh, 401k, um, then uh, your first year's um, uh, RMD will be just about $30,700 uh, today. So um, 
that might be great. And you might say, hey, that's great. I want that money and I'm going to spend that money. Or you you might say, uh, well, I'm going to have to, I, I really don't want that money. I don't need it today. I, I you know, I, I'm living off of some other money or I, whatever the situation is. Um, but uh, the, the issue is, is that you have to take it and you have to pay tax. And um, if you're 63 today and you're and obviously hopefully you're going to be 73 in 10 years, the problem is, is that we don't know what tax rates are going to be in 10 years. So you're, you're subject to the I don't know tax rate. But, you know, we do a lot of study around that this and our feelings are that your average middle class American is going to be in the 40 to 45 percent effective tax rate by around 2030. And that's that's much, much higher than it is today. So many people are looking for ways to say, okay, I want to plan for a way to help reduce or eliminate this required minimum distribution. And one of the things that they that that is allowed now is a qualified charitable distribution. So, uh, and I, geez, Louise, charitified. I wrote contributions. That is distributions. What's wrong with me? So I'm glad I saw that. Um, the uh, this allows for a distribution from your IRA to go direct to a charity. So allows charitable contributions up to one hundred thousand dollars per individual. Uh, they're incre- this this gets increased with Secure Two Point We're going to see that, um, and this gets in- adjusted for inflation, but not until twenty twenty four. Does that begin? But allows charitable contribution up to $100,000 per individual. So if you want it to, if it fit in your plan, folks, you've got to make sure you're not going to need this money before you start sending money away from funds that you can spend. So the first the first step is develop your financial plan. Identify that, hey, this is going to be extra money that I don't need during my lifetime. I don't want to pay unnecessary tax on it. Now, what can I do with it? You uh, um, you know, people sometimes get caught up in um, complex uh, and sophisticated uh, financial planning and, and tax planning, and they want to they want to get in on it, right? They want to get on Roth in on Roth conversions. They want to get in on uh, qualified charitable distributions and things like that. But what sometimes they miss is a lot of people over convert their money, over Roth convert their money, and um, some people, I'm sure, will be sending money to charities that they really should have kept and and had available for spending for those. So the first step is make sure this fits in your plan. So let's put this in here. So number one, make sure this fits in plan. Got to have a financial plan, folks. And for my seasoned veterans here, Type in the uh, in the chat box there. How often should these plans be reviewed? Uh, let's let's help teach our our new people that are just joining us. But um, uh, all right, so allows charitable contributions up to one hundred thousand dollars per individual, um, and uh, m- but it must be direct to the qualified charity. So it uh, it can't come to you first. You can't distribute one hundred thousand dollars from your IRA. Put it in your bank account, find your charity, and write a check. That's not how it works. If you write it, if you handle it that way, um, you may be able to deduct it as a charitable contribution, but you're you're certainly going to have to pay tax on that distribution that comes out. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a hundred thousand dollars. Remember, it can be up to a hundred thousand dollars per individual. So, if you're married couple under the rules, you could do um, uh, you could do two hundred thousand dollars today. All right. People are saying, yes, every year your plan should be reviewed every year. Thank you, Doug and David. Um, the, the third item here is it must be done after the donor passes age 70 and a half. Now, I know I told you earlier is age 73 for RMDs. These were set up for RMDs. These were set up before the first change of RMD age from 70 and a half to 72. But the IRS never changed this. Congress never changed the allowance of qualified charitable distributions at 70 and a half. And there's been at least one iteration of, of the Secure 2.0 and other clarification, regulation clarifications. And they've left this alone. So beginning at age 70 and a half, you can begin doing these 
um, uh, qualified charitable distribution. So again, if it's part of your plan and you want to start distributing money from your IRAs and not pay tax on that money, right? Because what happens is you distribute it direct to the charity. You don't pay tax on it. That's that's the, the other than the charitable reasons for it. That's the reason for it from a tax planning view. But you must wait until you cross that 70 and a half birthday. Listen, when my kids were young, and we still should be doing it now, but we always celebrated half birthdays. Because I said to my wife early on, I said, you only get so many of these, right? 18, and then they're off to college, and you who knows how often you're going to see them. One of my, my oldest daughters is going to be moving to Hawaii soon, and then uh, uh, from there someplace else. So I don't know where when we're going to see them. So we, we went through and celebrated these half birthdays. Well, folks, you know, you might want to start that again because you've got some triggering events. 59 and a half is when you could start pulling money out of your IRAs. 70 and a half is when you can start qualified charitable distributions if it fits in your plan. So it might be fun to start celebrating half birthdays. You know, we, we never get enough of them. So, it, but it must be done. If you do a qualified charitable distribution in the year you turn 70 and a half, and your 70 and a half birthday is not till June 6th, 2023, but you made the charitable contribution on June 5th, 2023, it's not going to count. You've got to cross that bridge. You've got to be past 70 and a half. I don't know how to um, accent that more. You have to follow the same substantiation rules for charitable itemized deductions um, that you would for a normal charitable deductions. They apply to a qualified charitable distribution. So we're going to talk more in detail about that. And documentation is required. And we're going to talk about these two things in more depth uh, in just a moment. So there are the basics. It's based off of required minimum distributions. That's how it came about. It allows you to empty money out of your IRAs up to $100,000 per individual uh, without paying tax. You have to identify a qualified charity. It has to be a qualified charity. Um, it uh, You send the money directly to the charity. You can't take a check, take a distribution from your IRA. Um, and and then send that check to the um, to the charity. It's got to come directly from the IRA custodian to the charity. Um, must be done after you turn age seventy and a half. So not in the year that you turn seventy and a half, but you've got to pass that cross that bridge. So start celebrating those half birthdays. If the um, the um, Validity of the qualified charitable distribution follows the same substantiation rules for chari charitable itemized deductions uh, for the QCD to be allowable. And documentation is required. So here's what we're going to do. I am sharing. I shared with you. The, I, I showed you the book. So this section here comes right out of this book. So I've got several pages. I'm going to go through them as quickly but as thoroughly as possible. So uh, I explained to you there are two ways as part of what we reviewed, two ways that Secure 2.0. So unfortunately, I don't know the date, but I think it was February or March. Uh, it must have been a little earlier than that. I think it was February of this year. So um, early 2023, we got this new regulation we, we refer to as Secure 2.0. So it's the update to the Secure Act. So one of the things that it did is it made some expansions to the qualified charitable distributions. It did a lot, but... Um, one of the things is, is it expanded the QCDs, the Qualified Charitable Distributions. And I may have just said deductions. What, whatever I say, contributions or deductions, what I mean is Qualified Charitable Distributions. It is a distribution from your IRA. Um, all right. So it reads here, and I'm not going to read every page to you. The IRA owners, I'm right here, IRA owners who are age 70 and a half and older can transfer up to $100,000 annually tax-free from their IRA to a charity by doing a qualified charitable distribution. Secure 2.0 expands QCDs uh, in two ways. Number one, right here. Secure 2.0 indexes the QCD limit of $100,000 limit for inflation. And that again, that begins in 2024. So it's not just stuck at $100,000. It's going to adjust every way, every um, year, given a for formula. Now, I I'm get, I haven't seen the formula. I haven't looked it up. It, it probably isn't a direct formula like um, consumer uh, price index. It's probably a little more complicated than that if if we're following government guidelines. 
because uh, everything else is a little more complicated. But um, we'll see how that works. Um, and then there's also Secure 2.0 allows certain split interest entities to receive QCDs. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the the split entities. So we talked about the fact that um, inflation is subject, uh, the inflation increase is, is increased starting 2024. Um, and this is, a, this is an important note. So QCDs remain available only to IRA owners. The Secure 2.0 did not expand QCDs to employer plans. So 401ks, 403bs, um, 457b plans, other um, simple IRAs, uh, well, yeah, I don't think simple IRAs apply, but not uh, not employer plans. So um, this is an area, right? So you, you've always got to pay attention to the details and you always hear me say there are critical items or critical elements that can make significant differences because you might take distributions from your 401k and sending it to a charity and think you're doing QCD, but you can you can do that for several years and you're doing it wrong. Uh, and that money all has to come back to you and you have to pay tax and penalties. So you got to be really careful. Um, so IRAs only, not employer plans. So what are split interests? Uh, let's just, let me just read this to you. Prior to the enactment of uh, Secure 2.0, QCDs could only be made to charities. Um, they were not allowed to be made to split interest entities. Split interest entities allow the donor to receive a benefit during her his or her lifetime or for a set term with the remaining benefiting uh, remainder benefiting a charity after the donor's death. Uh, and we're going to talk about what that they are. They're certain type of trusts and, and uh, allowable donations. Secure 2.0 changes this rule by allowing a one time only $50,000 to go to certain split interest uh, entities. One time only and up to $50,000. Um, you'll see another question about that later, but these qualifying split entities include charitable remainder trusts, uh, or referred to as CRATs. And here's the IRS code. If you want to pause this section, you can look up that IRS code. Uh, a charitable remainder unit trust or a CRUT. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of what's a CRAT and a CRUT and all, all the different trusts. Um, as defined by, uh, here again, here's the IRS code on that. Um, a... Um, a charitable gift annuity, again, the IRS code on that. Uh, this does require that the annuity must start fixed payments of 5% or greater, no later than one year from the date of funding, uh, if, it's, if it's a charitable gift annuity. So th that's an example, um, or that's really what the split interest entity. So you get some benefit during your lifetime or for a specific period of time, and then the remainder of it goes to the charity. $50,000 one time. Donor advised funds still don't qualify. Um, these are the requirements for these split interests to be um, uh, counted. Their contribution must be otherwise deductible as a charitable contribution under the IRS code um, section 170. Any income interest in the split interest entity must be only for the IRA owner and his or her spouse. So you can't name the income interest to be um, you know, anybody else. The income interest cannot be assigned Yes, um, that that would be um, after death. That's how I'm reading that. Distributions from the split interest entity must be treated as ordinary income to the IRA owner or spouse, reflecting no return of principal. And the split interest entity must be funded exclusively by the QCD. Uh, if it is funded by other uh, sources, it cannot be used for QCD. So you can't you you can't blend these things together. So I understand that's a little little complex. If you have uh, specific questions, I'm not going to go through this example. I actually omitted several examples because it's just too much. But if you have specific um, questions about, hey, I, I I'm interested in this. Um, you know, I've been t thinking about a charitable remainder trust or a charitable remainder muni trust or a charitable gift annuity, and I'd like to um, plan for that one-time distribution from my IRA to one of these trusts or annuity. Uh, that, or if I'm now over 70 and a half and I'd like to do that, then you can uh, reach out uh, directly. You can always reach us at questions at AtterboroughWealth.com, or that's questions at AtterboroughWealth.com, and uh, schedule time for us to talk. 
Okay, let's see. All right, so again, I'm not going to go over this. We just talked about it, but like, with the split interest, $50,000 per IRA owner, one time. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's okay. Oh, here's a good point. So here's an unknown. I like that, I like that Ed and his team do this because they, they basically say, watch out for this because we the, the changes don't address this, but... Um, this is something that you're that we're keeping an eye on. So here's the unknown. Secure 2.0 allows individuals to make a one-time $50,000 QCD qualified charitable distribution through charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder unit trusts, and charitable remainder annuity trusts. So that's what I just said. That's why I'm kind of going quickly. It's not clear, however, whether the $50,000 one-time distribution is subject to the overall annual $100,000 even if it's increased, QCD lim limit because QCDs of up to $100,000 annually and the one-time allowance of $50,000 to a split entity um, are in separate sections of the tax code. That's what the because. All right, so the, the allowances are in separate sections of the tax code. So what they're positing here is, Okay, could you really do $150,000 in one year? That's a question. It's not, It's not. you know, I'm not giving you a thought on it. That is unknown at this point. So we're, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to be looking for some clarity on that. So this is actually a really good taste. And, you know, I've got, I, I'm, I'm giving credit to Ed and his group here. So this is from 2023. As I told you, um, just April, as recent as April 26th through 28th. So this is kind of still hot off the presses, but I, I give credit. This is not my material. It's just, uh, you know, material I have access to on a regular basis. And I'm very appreciative of that. But I, so I want to give credit where credit's due. All this information comes from the manual. So this section here is, I, I wrote myself a note. This is from October, 2022. And um, this is really important, folks. So it's it's good to know about the expansion. You know, we can put more than $100,000 um, in uh, starting next year. Uh, it's good to know about split interest. That may or may not be a thing for you. But if you're considering qualified charitable distributions at all, these things I'm about to talk about, you must know about, or it, they, it could easily be disallowed. The significant advantage you have, again, if, if your plan works out where you can, it makes sense for you to... Take money out of your IRA and gift it directly to a charity. You're not going to use it over your lifetime. Um, then uh, you've, you've got to follow the rules on this and you can't be complacent about it. You can't mess around because it can really sting you if the IRS comes back and says you did it wrong. And folks, I'm just going to pull up this manual again because a good section of this, I don't know how many pages, but a good section of this manual every year is case law and, and, uh, tax court cases. So uh, people make mistakes about things all the time and they think they understand the rules and they've got it wrong. They get bad advice. Um, so QCDs are going to start making up more and more of these um, cases, these tax court cases gone wrong for the taxpayer. Um, so let's, let's look at um, some of the substantiation and benefit back rules. Um, so first is, just making sure I'm not cutting myself off here. Uh, again, you can, if you're, if you're a detail oriented pe person, I'm going to give you some IRS codes and IRS notices that you can look up yourself. Substantiation rules for charitable item, itemized deductions apply to qualified charitable distributions. So if you can't, uh, qualify the charity, charity at, normally as you would through your itemized deductions, you cannot uh, qualify it through a qualified charitable distribution. So there are two different things. The One of the strong benefits of the qualified charitable distribution is it goes right to the charity. It doesn't actually even hit your tax return. So you don't have to itemize. Most retirees don't itemize. They're getting their standard deduction. So you don't have to itemize. You don't have to follow the adjusted gross income limitations and all that. It goes right through. It distributes. There's no tax. It's easy but it still has to follow the same rules that would allow for an itemized charitable contribution. Hope that makes sense, right? Not the AGI rules, but the, the, um, the rules around it being a legitimate charity and how you document it. Hope that makes sense. AGI is adjusted gross income. But so uh, QCDs don't, you don't have to worry about <laughs> uh, 
I know it gets confusing. You, I know, uh, you don't have to worry about adjusted gross income with qualified charitable distributions, but you have to meet the same requirements to make it a real charity and to document it. Um, okay. So um, let's give here. So for substantiation rules for cash gifts to charity. So um, gifts under $250, a canceled check is fine or other receipt, that's okay. No aggregation required, meaning that each gift is separate contribution. If you give, say, $20 per week, these gifts are not combined. Um, cash gifts of $250 or more, there's a required item and it's a contemporaneous written acknowledgement. So hopefully you're getting these directly from the um, the charity and then you're keeping those in your tax record. So uh, that's a CWA. It's here's another you know set of initials. So we have RMD, we have QCD, we have um, a AGI. We have uh, uh, I shouldn't even include AGI because it's not part of QCDs. But uh, so we have RMDs, QCDs. And now we have CWAs. Um, so a CWA is contemporaneous uh, acknowledgement. You can think of a CWA as a CYA, and I think everybody knows what that means. I'm not going to say it here, but um, uh, that's from the charity. There is no aggregation, so each contribution must have a separate written acknowledgement. I'm going to read a lot of this because it's important. The CWA must include the amount contributed and whether the charity gave back any goods or services other than token and substantial or religious items. But we're going to talk about this. Uh, not, I, I don't mean to underline any of it. Um, I don't mean to under, underline uh, the religious part, including a good faith estimate of these goods and services. So the CWA must include the amount contributed and whether the charity gave back any goods or services, including a good faith estimate of those goods and, or services. All right. What does contemporaneous mean? It means that the written acknowledgement form, uh, written acknowledgement from the charity must be in hand by the earlier of the date the tax return is filed or the due date of the tax return, including extensions. Um, so it's not something you can go back and get if your filings are late, right? Uh, QCD qualifications donation must be 100% deductible. Uh, to qualify as a QCD, the contribution would have to be 100% deductible as a charitable contribution is what I was talking about earlier for itemized deduction purposes if it were made outside of the IRA. So again, it doesn't it doesn't follow these same adjusted gross income guidelines, but it has to meet the same parameters, right? The same requirements if you were doing it outside the IRA. Um, and that explains that sentence explains that. However, the seven and a half percent adjusted gross income limitation does not apply, and the QCD amount does not affect any other AGI limitation. Doesn't even hit your tax return. Um, and again, here's the code section if you're into that kind of thing of the IRS code. Split interest gifts. Uh, so we talked about these won't qualify as QCDs because they're not. Oh, excuse me. So that was remember, this was twenty two. So this is important. So that's no longer the case. Now it's up to $50,000, uh, one time each. So this is a really good example of why it's important to stay in, on top of things. If you were, if somebody was re relying on, a, on, you know, an old manual, this is from October. So it's not that old, but you'll see that split interest gifts aren't allowed as of October, but they're allowed as of February of this year. So that's good. Um, donors must have a uh, CWA from the charity, and there can be nothing received in return except those goods or services the IRS allows to be dis disregarded. So we'll look at that below. Otherwise, a QCD is disqualified. The funds uh, transferred from the IRA to the charity will be included in, in income. That's scary. Think about it. If you The way this happens is, it does, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm backing away from the microphone. I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but the way this happens is it's not uh, It's not like you you follow your, you do your QCD, you're older than 70 and a half, you do your QCD, you, you file your tax returns, you have a, you have a distribution that comes out of your, your um, tax return or excuse me, distribution comes out of your IRA that's not reported on your tax return. So it's a tax-free distribution, but you fail to get a proper CWA. 
So that's it's at the IRS. You don't, you know, typically isn't notified or you, isn't going to discover this right away. It may be something that's that you discover or you have, you know, a general audit or something like that. And this might go on for years. Now, think about if you're doing one hundred thousand dollars a year or fifty thousand dollars a year or for crying out loud, just ten thousand dollars a year. And it goes on for five years, for example. And now you've got to take all that money back as income. That stinks. Um and uh, and you don't uh, you, you won't necessarily you won't get the money back. You have to report it as income because you've already given it to the charity. You'd have to write to the charity. I don't even know how that would work. You'd have to write to the charity and see if they'll return it. But I don't think that would be the case. So so then you you end up paying tax on something you don't even have. So it's important to do the do it the right way. Uh, the uh, this is a good point. Disqualified QCDs may also qualify for an itemized deduction if itemizing, but again, most people don't. So just avoid it. Uh, uh, just do it the right way. What about small token gifts? Uh, small token items is a gray area, but there is some IRS guidance. The, bre- the best practice is not to receive anything in return to make sure the QCD will qualify. This all comes down to the charity's own interpretation of these rules and what they show on the written acknowledgement letter they provide. If the charity shows that no goods or services were provided to the contributor, that should be sufficient. Folks, if you're on a board, charitable organization, make sure your CWAs are appropriate. Now, you'd be doing your um, your folks a, a favor, right? your contributors. So disregard it. Gifts back to the, go- the donor. This is an example, and here's the IRS publication. Under the tax code and regulations, goods or services of insubstantial value can be disregarded, including intangible religious benefits. Certain memberships can be disregarded. Any rights or privileges that you can use frequently while you are a member, such as um, uh, free or discounted admissions to the organization's facilities or events, free or discounted parking, preferred access to goods or services, and dis- discounts on the purchase of good um goods and services, but item one uh, doesn't include rights to purchase tickets for seatings at an athletic event in an athletic stadium of a college or university as a result of the contribution uh, to such an institution. Listen, folks, again, it it limits, it limits the value at $11 and 30 cents. Just don't, just don't take anything is my advice. If, if you're using QCDs as a planning technique um, and it can be very powerful, just don't take anything. Um, it's, it's just not worth it. Uh, cause you'll see here that I'm just seeing there's a, a section here that talks about it being disallowed. So let's, let's, let's see if we can find that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, what happens? Let's talk about this. We talked about because we, we talked about the charity issuing the CWA. Um, okay, that should be. That, I think we've covered that. What happens to the QCD if there are benefits, goods, or services given back to the donor? The QCD fails if anything with a value beyond the member membership benefits or token item exceptions is received back. Um, for QCDs, though, if it turns out something of value was received, the tax penalty is greater than with an itemized deduction. With an itemized deduction, if you give $10,000 but receive value in return of $500 in gifts, dinners, et cetera, then you still receive a net deduction of $9,500. So if you were doing a normal itemized deduction of your charitable contributions and you, you um, in an audit, it was discovered that you received $500 back, they, they could make an adjustment and say, well, listen, you're only getting the deduction of $9,500, $9,500. However, if you do the same thing with a QCD, the entire QCD fails. So they don't adjust it by $500. They say it, it didn't work. You did it wrong. Now you have to realize the entire contribution is income. So I think, think about that, or entire distribution as income. Let's say you do the maximum amount, $100,000. Uh, $100, uh, you you sent it direct to the charity. You did everything you're supposed to do. The the um, uh, the even if the, uh, the the charity writes you a letter, but you get a value of five hundred dollars, and it's determined that you get a value of five hundred dollars. Um, the uh, the IRS in this audit sees that value. 
uh, and uh, and it actually should be listed in the letter, right? Because it'll tell you the value of the um, of the uh, contribution. The entire hundred thousand dollars comes back to you as income. So again, you may not get the probably won't get the hundred thousand dollars back from the charity, but you're going to have to pay tax on that hundred thousand dollars. So do it right. This is why it's it's best not to receive anything back, so there there will be no issue. I'm here. This is why it is best not to receive anything back, so there will never be an issue. All right, so here's some additional guidelines. I'm just going to leave them here for a minute if you want to pay attention to the sections. So IRS regulation section 1.170A1 through 13, subsection F, 8, I, and B. So you can search those all yourself, but uh, I'll leave those there for a second. And then there are more. We talked about IRS publication 52 or 526, excuse me. So IRS um, publication 526 refers to charitable contributions. And you can read through all of that if you'd like. Um, and these are just some more details and repeating. Uh, and these are directly from the publication. And that should be our last page. So um, I hope that that was helpful regarding QCDs. I also hope that you got to see, I'm trying to go back to the beginning. I just want to share with you, look at all these pages that we just went over. So really, I hope that this has been good information for you. I'm trying to get back to the top there. There you go. So we talked about qualified charitable distributions and how they uh, line up with uh, your required minimum distributions. That was the purpose, but not really anymore because you can start a QCD, qualified charitable distribution, 70 and a half. You don't have to start your RMDs today until age 73, but that's okay. It should be part of your planning if it makes sense for you. But only if it makes sense for you. Make sure it fits in your plan. You don't want to, um, you don't want to send funds to a charity that you may have to use during your lifetime. And there's only one way, one way to determine whether you're going to need that money, and that is through proper, thorough, and comprehensive financial planning. Um, so make sure it fits in your plan. Uh, the QCD allows charitable contributions up to $100,000 per individual. This will start increasing for inflation next year. Must be issued direct to the qualified charity from the IRA. Must be done after the donor passes 70 and a half. Not in the year you turn 70 and a half, but you must pass that half birthday at 70 and a half. And we went over a lot of substantiation rules for charitable itemized deductions and how they apply to the QCD and the documentation that's required. So I hope that was all helpful. Uh, we do have a question. So Doug asked, can I write checks personally directly from an IRA account to a charity as a QCD? I guess if you have the ability to write an IRA, uh, a check directly from your IRA, um, I guess you probably could. I don't think I would do it that way. I, I would make sure, I, I think I would have the um, custodian, right? So we cu we custody with Charles Schwab, but a custodian could be Fidelity, Vanguard, whomever. I would I would do a request, whatever written request there is for the custodian. Um, we, we uh, it wouldn't even, I, 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 I'm trying to think of what it would be. I don't handle that side of things, but it would either be a third party check request or an, uh, or uh, or a combination of third party check request and an uh, IRS or excuse me IRA distribution form um, uh, here you know with us but um, whatever your custodian requires I would submit it through them in their proper documentation and have them issue it directly to the um, the the uh, charity for record keeping I wouldn't mess around with issuing it yourself and Jerry just clarified my question pertain to a non-spouse beneficiary. So let me let me uh, address that offline, Jerry. If you want to send me that question, I'm happy to do that. We're coming up uh, to 1053. I uh, appreciate you all being here. I hope that was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send questions into questions at adelborwealth.com. That's questions at adelborwealth.com. If you want to schedule time to see me, you can also uh, find a time by emailing us at questions at adelborwealth.com. Uh, if you haven't already, you hit the subscribe, like, and notification button on the uh, on YouTube. And uh, otherwise, I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you all next week. Take care.